Welcome back to Antisocial Studies, the podcast for people who wish they'd stayed awake in high school. Last episode, we covered the Cold War from above. China turned communist and lost its mind under Mao, and the U.S. and the Soviets battled it out by never battling it out, and the U.S. won when its enemy stopped existing in 1991. Well, that was easy. Today, let's look back through that same time period in Latin America. This is a region where the Cold War heavily influenced their politics and attempts at true independence. Latin America, remember, at the beginning was a collection of Spanish colonies that gained independence in the 1800s, only to be Monroe doctrined into the sphere of influence of the United States. And unfortunately, Latin America is going to try to assert true self-control in the shadow of the Cold War, and they will learn very quickly that while it's easy to gain outside help from one of the two superpowers, it's also just as easy and inevitable that you will make yourself a quick and powerful enemy on the other side. Important note for true American patriots. Today's episode is not going to be quite as patriotic as the last one. I mean, Rocky can do a lot, but he can't fight the fact that the United States did a lot of bad things in the name of the war on communism in Latin America. You see what I did there? Fight the fact? Ah, oh, Rocky. Also, beware my bias. Full disclosure, I focused on Latin American studies in college, and you can't really go through those classes without gaining a hefty degree of sympathy for the Latin American people's perspective. Great job, UNC. You had one job to do. Convert me into a basketball fan. But instead, you radicalized me with your empathy and global perspective. (sighs) What a giant waste of money. This is Antisocial Studies. I'm Emily Glankler. Settle in and let's go back in time. Act 1. 20th Century Latin America. So remember the tension between military governments and the peasants that I mentioned popped up during and after their revolutions? Yeah, that tension never went away. Remember that a lot of countries gained independence under the direction of military juntas that formed to rule on behalf of the true king while Napoleon was Napoleoning all over Europe. The revolutions became a strange mix between white creoles in the military who wanted power and indigenous peasants who wanted freedom. In the 20th century, the same forces that led to the rise of extreme governments in Europe had a similar impact on Latin America. The Great Depression and the rise of leftist socialist groups prompted a lot of militaries around Latin America to take direct control of the government. A lot of these military dictatorships were attracted to fascism, or at least elements of fascism, as witnessed in Italy and Germany during World War II. This is why after the war, so many Nazis fled to South America— They knew that they would find semi-sympathetic governments who were also anxious to gain technology and scientific knowledge to help advance their economies and get out of the U.S.'s shadow. Over 9,000 Nazi officers and collaborators fled to South America in the years after World War II. Many went to Brazil and Chile, but over half went just to Argentina. Why? Well, first, there were a ton of German immigrants already in Argentina before the war, so they kept close ties with the Nazi government. Plus, these governments were all fascist-leaning, especially with the rising socialist and communist movements across the region. Juan Perón was a military general who took power in Argentina from 1945 to 1955. During his first presidency, he established escape routes to help get Nazis out of Europe and into Argentina. Now, as far as we know, his wife Eva Perón had nothing to do with this, but it still puts the musical Evita into a slightly different light. Don't cry for me, Argentina? Yeah, we won't. Side note, the South Americans and the Russians, remember the aliens? They weren't the only ones recruiting Nazis. In the United States, we had an innocuously named Operation Paperclip. After World War II, U.S. Army special agents recruited over 1,600 German scientists and technicians, many of whom were Nazi members and even Nazi leadership. The world's first long-range ballistic missile was developed in the U.S. by a German aerospace engineer. So, military dictatorships rose across Latin America. Why? Well, there was a lot of social unrest in the post-war world. Especially as communist ideology was spreading around the globe, peasants and workers who had long been at the bottom of the social hierarchy saw an opportunity to complete their ancestors' original vision of revolution. Enhanced by growing worker mobilization and socialist movements, the upper classes and their money flocked to the military governments to protect their power and privilege. Unfortunately, this process also had a racial element thanks to the caste system we discussed from the Spanish colonial era. Most of the people in the top social classes were whites or mestizos, while most of the groups at the bottom were of indigenous or African descent. 
It's similar to the United States, even though on paper all citizens were equal, race and socioeconomic hierarchy were, and still are, strongly correlated. These military dictatorships were brutal. For example, in Argentina, years after Juan Perón's rule, the military government had a war that was actually so bad it was just called the Dirty War. In the 1970s, the government hunted down political dissidents and anyone associated with leftist causes. Around 30,000 people just disappeared. They are known as Los Desaparecidos. It's still not known what happened to a lot of these victims. They were often young students, journalists, and activists, although it's generally assumed that they were tortured for information and killed. Some newly declassified documents talk of people being flown out on military planes far into the Atlantic Ocean and dropped into the water still alive. A group of women known as Los Madres de Plaza de Mayo protested and marched on the government in the late 70s, demanding to know what had happened to their children. Facing intense backlash from the government, I mean the founder of the movement was kidnapped, tortured, and killed, these women continued protesting far beyond the fall of the dictatorship. Although most of the men involved in the Dirty War are serving life in prison for their crimes, the organization of Los Madres continues to be active in promoting human rights around the world. Don't mess with moms, man. Oh, and by the way, the U.S. secretly backed this military dictatorship in Argentina. Yeah. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger gave the government the green light that it would have the U.S.'s support in its fight against socialism. It's important to note that, one, most Americans knew nothing about this. We only learned about it from an expose written in the late 80s. And two, there were American diplomats who tried to stop it. U.S. Ambassador to Argentina, Republican Robert Hill, worked behind the scenes to prevent the human rights abuses by the military government, under threat of being fired by Kissinger. But obviously he was unsuccessful. So this begs the question, why did the United States support these brutal dictatorships? And not just in Latin America, by the way, but we'll get there next episode. Well, all you really need to know is who was on the other side. In most of these countries, military dictatorships arose in opposition to the rise of populist and socialist leaders. I haven't mentioned it up until now, but a large part of communist ideology is anti-imperialism. This is somewhat ironic considering the Russians themselves built up their own sort of empire, but oh well. Communism, or really far-left socialism, was appealing to a lot of Latin Americans for some very legitimate reasons. First, they have felt like they were under the thumb of some Western empire since 1492. First Spain and Portugal directly, and then indirectly by the United States. Remember our nickname, the Bully of the North? Second, the Latin American economy was set up very unfairly for most of the population. The modern agricultural economy, for example, was still based on the colonial encomienda system. So a few men owned most of the land, while peasants worked that land for very little. And even worse, as the U.S.'s influence grew, a lot of this land was bought up by American corporations. Similarly, in the urban economy, governments were attempting to industrialize so that they wouldn't have to rely on other countries to import manufactured goods. They were doing okay during the Depression and the war. Those 15 years sort of paused the expansion of the Western economy and started to allow smaller countries to catch up. But once the war was over the U.S. began pushing neoliberal economic policies that tried to integrate the global economy more than ever before. This was good for the U.S., who had a thriving economy and he wanted to go out and sell all of its stuff, but it was really bad for the third world, who was still behind and thus was forced to provide just raw materials and cheap labor to the industrialized world. So, when socialists rose up across Latin America calling for revolution, people, especially peasants and people of African descent, listened. But so did the United States. Uh Uh-oh. Quick tip. If you, listening, are the leader of a Latin American government, there are two words you should never say if you want to avoid getting overthrown. Nationalization and redistribution. Oh, shoot. I shouldn't have said it out loud. If my podcast ends suddenly, you know that the CIA got me. Tell my story. Nationalization means taking land or other assets that were privately owned and nationalizing them, or taking them for the government. This is definitely a socialist idea and was not popular if you were the owner of said land or other assets that were being taken away. That makes sense. On the flip side, this is a very popular idea if you belong to a nation that had most of its land or other assets controlled by foreign companies for the last few hundred years. Just saying. So throughout the 20th century, a lot of politicians gained popularity by calling for nationalization of things like oil and other large-scale industries like mining, banking, or even agriculture. Uh Uh-oh, 
Studying history is a lot like watching a scary movie and constantly yelling at the characters to not go into the basement. Like, no, Allende, don't call for a nationalization of industry. Stay with the group and get out of that house. So the real sticking point across Latin America wasn't mining, it wasn't healthcare, it wasn't even oil. It was bananas. And no, not like, ooh, things were crazy, it was bananas. Like, actual bananas. Major agricultural corporations like the United Fruit Company had gained an insane foothold into most of Central America. So much so that these countries just became known as banana republics. Yeah. The store was founded in 1978. Their first products were repurposed military apparel in the midst of a bunch of U.S.-backed coups and military dictatorships across Central America and these so-called banana republics. I've always had a big issue with this, like the name of the store. It seems really offensive to me, but based on a quick internet search, most other people don't agree or just don't care as much as I do. Anyway... These foreign companies, especially the United Fruit Company, really were like the Mr. Burns-type evil corporations as far as Latin America is concerned. Like, excellent. The United Fruit Company lobbied the U.S. government to get it to orchestrate coups or overthrows of democratically elected governments because leaders would push for nationalization of industry and redistribution of land. This meant that the government would take land from foreign companies and either control the land itself or redistribute it to peasants as smaller farms. Either way, this idea was not okay for those foreign corporations, and so they pushed the government to take action. And the United Fruit Company didn't go away. They just changed their name to Chiquita Banana today. Not to, like, totally ruin your grocery store experience, but sorry. Now, I do totally understand why a government taking privately owned land is unpopular, especially in the capitalist mecca of the United States. But again, historical context is important. From the view of a lot of Latin Americans, that land was obtained illegally in the first place. The conservative governments that rose up after the revolutions sold off that land, often for personal profit, to the highest bidder, and that was normally American companies. So while this was seen as fair game by the foreigners, a lot of people in Latin America viewed nationalization and redistribution as just taking back what was stolen from them. Either way, nationalization and redistribution sound pretty socialist-y, and socialism is just a gateway drug to communism. The U.S. cannot have that in its hemisphere, so it's time to call up the CIA. Act 2, The Cold War in Latin America. So how did the U.S. support the fight against communism in Latin America? Well, they sent money and weapons to governments fighting against leftist governments or insurgencies. A more direct example is that they invited many officials from those governments to the prestigious U.S. Army School of the Americas. Located at Fort Benning in Georgia, the School of the Americas provided military training to government personnel from U.S. allied countries across Latin America. It was founded in 1946, just one year after the end of World War II. Man, the Cold War was on in Latin America. After 1961, its goal was specifically to teach anti-communist counterinsurgency training. Hundreds of military officials were all educated as they helped support conservative governments across Latin America. At the school, they learned how to fight against guerrilla movements, how to use all the weapons the U.S. was also giving their governments, and how to use torture in the fight against communism. Several Latin American dictators were educated here, and let me tell you about a few. First, there's Colonel Domingo Monterosa from El Salvador. He was responsible for the El Mozote massacre of 800 civilians during the Salvadoran Civil War in 1981. Other military officers from El Salvador were also responsible for the assassination of Archbishop Oscar Romero and other Jesuit priests who resisted the dictatorship. Or maybe there's Frank Romain from Haiti. He led a special operations unit organized by the Haitian dictator that assaulted and burned down a church in 1988 with dozens of people inside. More recently, Colombian Colonel Alberto Quijano attended the school. He was arrested in 2007 for providing security and mobilizing Colombian special forces in support of Don Diego, the leader of the Norte del Valle cartel and one of the FBI's 10 most wanted criminals. Whoops. Now, I'm not saying that these people were told to do these terrible things by the U.S. military. I'm sure, and for the sake of my patriotism, I have to believe that they weren't. 
But I am saying that they were trained and supported by the U.S. military in the name of the war on communism. Human rights activists have closely monitored the School of the Americas for years and its graduates documenting crimes committed by officers who came through the school. And the school was eventually closed in 2000. Oh, but I mean, it reopened one month later, but they changed the name to the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation. I guess they figured the longer the name, the more likely people would just give up and leave them alone. But not this girl. I see you, School of the Americas. So how else did the U.S. fight the Cold War in Latin America? Well, when a government would start to say the words you can't say if you don't want to get overthrown, the U.S. would send in the CIA, and we would have a good old-fashioned coup. Sometimes these military overthrows were actually instigated by the U.S., but more often, the U.S. just sent support to already existing conservative groups, often the military. And unfortunately, there are a lot of instances of this happening, but let's look at one example. In 1944, the Guatemalan people overthrew their authoritarian government and established a democracy. This new government introduced things like the minimum wage and universal suffrage, starting Guatemala on the path toward liberal democracy. In 1951, Jacobo Arbenz was elected president, and he started calling for land reform. Oh no! Don't go in the basement, Arbenz! There are bananas down there! (music) To be clear, he did not propose taking land that was already being used, but just taking uncultivated land and giving it to landless peasants. The owners of the land would be compensated, and in the end, the reform only affected like 1,700 out of 350,000 land holdings in the country. Arbenz passed reforms that outlawed abusive labor practices, which the United Fruit Company had been using for decades in the country. All of this combined to get Arbenz overthrown. Not by the people of Guatemala, they loved his reforms. But under President Eisenhower, the CIA implemented Operation PB Success. They funded trained, and armed an army of Guatemalans to overthrow the democratically elected government. Guatemala City was bombed, and the U.S. blockaded the country with its navy. The coup was also supported by a U.S.-funded campaign of psychological warfare. Radio stations broadcasted anti-government propaganda and a false version of the coup, portraying it as a national revolution. The CIA sent death notices to communist leaders for 30 days in a row, They would paint messages on their houses like, you have five days left, and sent them coffins and nooses to intimidate them. After briefly attempting to arm civilians and resist, Arbenz resigned in 1954 and a dictatorship was instated. This new government banned opposition parties, imprisoned and tortured political opponents, and reversed all of the social reforms of the democracy. Forty years of civil war followed in Guatemala between leftists and the military, including a genocide of the Mayan population in the country, often called the Silent Holocaust. So, there's that. And just in case you were thinking, well, that's bad, but I mean, communism, right? No, Arbenz was not a communist, and the government found no evidence of Soviet influence in the country. And man, they looked for it. The international community condemned the coup and U.S. involvement, which prompted another government operation called PB History. They scoured all of our Benz's communications for any evidence that could justify the coup, and they didn't find anything. What they did learn was that in the future, if they wanted to get involved, they would have to be more secretive. So since we don't have time right now to go over every other example of the U.S. helping take down a popularly chosen government, let me just list a few more. 1961, the U.S. backs Dominican dictator Rafael Trujillo. After his assassination, the U.S. sent 22,000 American troops to the Dominican Republic to help the military oust the new democratically elected president. 1964, Operation Brother Sam helped overthrow the president of Brazil and install a military government that would rule the country for the next 20 years. 1973, Kissinger brags that the U.S. created the conditions for the coup overthrowing democratically elected Salvador Allende in Chile. The U.S. publicly criticized the subsequent regime of dictator Augusto Pinochet while secretly sending support. During Pinochet's 16 years in power, 3,000 people were executed, 80,000 people were sent to internment camps, and tens of thousands were tortured by the government. 1975, The U.S. implements Operation Condor, a campaign of political repression and state-sponsored terror across South America meant to eradicate communism from the continent. 
At least 60,000 people were killed, including union and peasant leaders, students and teachers, priests and nuns, and intellectuals and suspected leftists. The 1980s. The U.S. arms and supports the Contras in Nicaragua, a collection of right-wing rebel groups fighting the socialist government. More on that one next episode. So, yeah. Remember when I said this episode wouldn't be quite as patriotic? (laughs) Believe me, my intention is not to just hate on the United States, although I get that it seems that way right about now. But I just believe it's really irresponsible to only teach about the good stuff. If we look back and think of the Cold War as just a very scary, very tense, philosophical debate, then that's irresponsible. I also think it's problematic to keep calling it the Cold War, because, yeah, the U.S. and the Soviet Union never fought, but almost everywhere else in the world did. I also think it's important as Americans to learn this side of the story, because Latin America is an incredibly important region for the United States, as allies in the hemisphere, potential trading partners, and the source of a lot of immigrants to our country. We have to learn their side of the story to understand just how much the decisions that we make in the United States, which may seem like a really good logical idea on our side of the border, have enormous impacts and ripple effects to our neighbors in the South. So after the Cold War ended, support for these military dictatorships went out of fashion. Slowly, they were dismantled and new democracies have been growing in their place, but these democracies have a lot working against them mostly a long tradition of corruption, corporate interference, and the threat of being ousted if their decisions are unpopular. But one Latin American country did successfully avoid U.S. overthrow, but it wasn't for a lack of trying on our part. Act 3. Viva la Revolución in Cuba. Remember that ever since the 1898 Cuban War for Independence, a.k.a. the Spanish-American War, the U.S. has had extreme influence over the Cuban government. Over the next 50 years, that influence grew as Havana became a destination for American tourists, business people, and the mob. Inequality in Cuba was massive. Sugarcane planters spent half the year unemployed, roaming the countryside for work. They would really come in handy when Castro later is looking for soldiers. Cuba was also racially segregated, much like the U.S. at the same time. Even their dictator, Fulgencio Batista, who's a mulatto, was denied entry into one of Havana's most exclusive clubs. Cuba was essentially two different worlds, the glittering Havana that lives in the memory of many exiles and the beautifully annoying song by Barry Manilow, and rural Cuba that was more like an impoverished third world country. The reason the U.S. was able to assert so much influence was because, of course, it was supporting a brutal dictatorship that allowed American companies to run rampant in Cuba. 1950s Cuba was run by Batista, an effective leader turned dictator. Backed by the U.S. government, he suspended the Constitution, controlled the university, the press, and embezzled tons of money. He aligned himself with wealthy sugar planters— and the U.S. slowly took control of more sugar plantations, and by the end of his rule, over 70% of the arable land in Cuba was owned by Americans. On top of this, the American mafia controlled the gambling, drug, and prostitution businesses in Havana. The Hotel Nacional in Havana, where I stayed for one night, no big deal, became a sort of headquarters for the American mafia. They even hosted the Havana Conference in 1946, This was a historic meeting between the U.S. Mafia and the Cosa Nostra, or the Sicilian Mafia. American companies were awarded lucrative contracts by the government, and Batista and his supporters made tons of money allying with the Americans, all while the inequality between the rich and poor grew exponentially. All of this is to say that when Castro and Che come along, there are a lot of people who are more than willing to overthrow the Batista regime. President Kennedy said it best, quote, I believe there is no country in this world, including the African regions, including any and all the countries under colonial domination, where economic colonization, humiliation, and exploitation were worse than in Cuba, in part owing to my country's policies during the Batista regime. I believe that we created, built, and manufactured the Castro movement out of whole cloth and without realizing it. 1963. There are also a lot of people at the top of the Cuban hierarchy who will lose an enormous amount after the revolution. Many of them are still in Florida and still bitter about what they lost to the communists. And they also have a lot of money and have formed a very influential lobby that still to this day pushes the U.S. government to maintain the embargo on Cuba. We'll get there in a second. So, who were Fidel Castro and Che Guevara? 
Fidel Castro was the son of a Spanish immigrant and sugarcane farmer in a province mostly controlled by the United Fruit Company. Ugh, again with the damned United Fruit Company. Fidel attended Havana Law School where he was radicalized. Learn a lesson from Lenin, Mao, and Fidel, parents. Do not send your child to college or they will become a communist revolutionary. He practiced law and was up for election in the Cuban House of Representatives in the year that Batista suspended the Constitution and canceled the election in 1956. Castro attempted a rebellion by attacking the Makada barracks, but it failed and he was imprisoned. In this way, his story is pretty similar to Hitler's, although his ideology is extreme left, unlike Hitler's extreme right philosophy. Like Hitler, Castro was released from prison soon after, partly because he was such a charismatic speaker and he gained influence during his impassioned defense while on trial. It was during this trial that he made his famous quote, Condemn me, it does not matter. History will absolve me. Fidel left for Mexico, where he was exiled, and he and his brother met up with a young Argentine doctor. Ernesto Che Guevara was a medical student in Buenos Aires, but he became radicalized when he traveled around the Americas on his motorcycle. Immortalized by his own motorcycle diaries, Che saw hunger, poverty, and disease. And he blamed much of the suffering of the Latin Americans on U.S. imperialism. This wasn't totally unfair, especially considering that he was in Guatemala when the U.S.-backed coup occurred, overthrowing democratically elected Arbenz. Che ended up in Mexico City, where he met the Castro brothers. They joined together and created the 26th of July movement, named after the attack on the Moncada barracks, and they set off for Cuba on a yacht named the Grandma. Yeah, probably not quite as badass as they would have hoped. The Cuban Revolution started out pretty lackluster. There were just 80 people on the ship, and soon after they landed, they were attacked by Batista's men. Only 20 people survived, and they escaped to the Sierra Maestra Mountains in eastern Cuba. Although it's romantic to tell the story as if there were literally only 20 people at the beginning of the revolution, that's not really true. There were a lot of members of the movement who hadn't been exiled to Mexico, and they were ready to start the revolution upon Fidel's return. The fighting grew in the rural countryside. Like Mao, Fidel gained a following amongst the peasants before he eventually took on the cities, where Batista had the advantage. Their guerrilla warfare was successful in the countryside. During one battle, the Battle of La Plata, Castro's forces defeated a battalion of 500 men while losing only three of his own. Fidel Castro organized his rebel fighters into various columns led by himself, Che Guevara, Camilo Cienfuegos, and the student-led Revolutionary Directorate. From various positions across Cuba, they advanced on Havana and won a series of battles. News of these victories caused Batista to flee to the Dominican Republic on January 1st, 1959. Fidel Castro and his army marched into Havana on January 8th, the new rulers of Cuba. With the establishment of the new government, punishment of those linked to Batista's government began almost immediately. Arrests, torture, plus the execution of around 600 people found guilty by revolutionary courts all occurred within the first months of Castro's rule. Elections promised by Castro were continuously postponed. However, it was not clear at the beginning that Castro was a communist. This is hard for us to understand now because we so associate communism with Castro's Cuba, but he had not openly declared himself as anything more than a revolutionary who wanted to get rid of the Batista government. In fact, the United States was one of the first governments to recognize the legitimacy of the new Castro government, hoping to keep Cuba as an ally, especially since there were so many American corporate interests on the island. But the U.S. would not go so far as to send financial help to the new government, and so Castro began new taxation, forced lending to the government, and land reform. Uh Uh-oh. All land holdings that exceeded 1,000 acres were taken by the government. This was overseen by Che Guevara. Landowners were paid in government bonds that could not be cashed in for 20 years. Cuba's economy was in a nosedive as investment dropped, unemployment rose, and the people defected and left the island left and right. In 1960, Cuba signed a trade pact with the Soviet Union, and a year later, President Eisenhower severed all ties with Cuba, one of his last acts as president. Also in 1961, 1,500 Cuban exiles under the direction and training of, you guessed it, the CIA, were sent back to the island to start a counter-revolution. The Bay of Pigs invasion failed miserably and was the last direct effort by the U.S. to overthrow the Castro regime, although assassination attempts are in the hundreds. It wasn't until the end of this year, in 1961, after the Bay of Pigs, that Castro officially declared himself a Marxist. The Cold War was on in Cuba. Side note, 
the U.S. tried to assassinate Castro so many times that historians have had to separate the attempts into five phases. The CIA met with the heads of the Chicago and Miami Mafia, both of whom were on the FBI's most wanted list at the time, and they offered them $150,000 to help them get access to Cuban officials who could poison Castro's food. Among other attempts, the CIA tried poisoned cigars, exploding cigars, an infected scuba diving suit, along with a booby-trapped conch, se- conch shell at the bottom of the seafloor where Castro liked to dive. The CIA also tried to assassinate his character. They tried giving him thallium salts to destroy his famous beard. The CIA laced his radio studio with LSD to disorient him during his regular broadcasts and damage his credibility. As recently as 2000, the government placed 90 kilograms of explosives under a podium in Panama where he was scheduled to talk. All of these attempts failed. Castro once said, quote, If surviving assassination attempts were an Olympic event, I would win a gold medal. The height of the Cold War, of course, occurred on the island of Cuba in 1962. This was the closest the U.S. and USSR ever came to actual nuclear conflict. So after the failed Bay of Pigs invasion, the Soviets secretly agreed to start placing nuclear missiles into Cuba to protect them from future U.S. intervention. President Kennedy knew that the Soviets were arming the Cubans with defensive weapons, and he was okay with this. But in October 1962, U-2 spy planes took photos of sites for ballistic nuclear missiles, proving that Khrushchev had lied to Kennedy about only arming them with defensive weapons. JFK assembled a collection of his military and diplomatic advisors who mostly pushed for a straight-up bombing of Cuba. It's a really interesting conundrum if you'll remember that Kennedy, as a student at Harvard, had written a book all about Britain's appeasement of Hitler during the 1930s. Now he was faced with a similar issue— either take a hardline stance and risk nuclear war, or appease and go too soft and let the Soviets gain an aggressive foothold just 90 miles from your coastline. Kennedy took a middle path. He ordered a naval quarantine of Cuba. He specifically didn't use the term blockade because that is associated with the current state of war. But JFK also sent Khrushchev a letter saying that he would end the quarantine once the Soviets agreed to remove all offensive weapons from the island. And he also did what JFK does best, and he went on TV to announce all of this to the public, stating that any attack with missiles from Cuba anywhere in the Western Hemisphere would be regarded by the U.S. as a Soviet attack on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response. Man, bringing out that old Monroe doctrine, and brushing it off and giving it a new nuclear sheen. Khrushchev responded that the quarantine was an act of war by the United States, and he ordered Soviet ships to break through the U.S. Navy and continue supplying Cuba with weapons. For 13 days, the U.S. military was placed on DEFCON 2, the second highest level of military alert. Behind the scenes, Kennedy and Khrushchev were negotiating and trying to hammer out a deal. The Soviets did agree to remove the weapons from Cuba if the U.S. promised a few things in return. So Khrushchev first sent a communication to JFK that said they would remove the missiles if the U.S. agreed to never again invade the island of Cuba. But then, later on, they sent another letter that sounded really different in tone that added that the U.S. also had to remove its missiles from Turkey that were stationed near and pointing at the Soviet Union. The same day that the Soviets sent these two kind of confusingly different letters of demands— an American U-2 reconnaissance plane was shot down over Cuba. While Kennedy prepared for war, he also searched for any diplomatic resolution. Kennedy chose something interesting, and he decided to just ignore the second letter and respond as if he had only read the first. He sent back a communication agreeing to not invade the island if the Soviets would dismantle the weapons under the supervision of the United Nations. But... JFK also sent his brother, Attorney General Bobby Kennedy, to secretly talk with the Soviet ambassador. Bobby Kennedy told the ambassador something that had to remain top secret. The missiles in Turkey were growing outdated, and they'd already planned on removing them in the next six months. Basically, he was agreeing to the second demand, but in private. So the U.S. would dismantle those weapons, but later on, so that it wouldn't be associated with the Cuban Missile Crisis and make Kennedy look like he had given up too much in the eyes of the American public. Sneaky, sneaky. 
Before we move on, I would like to introduce you to a man named Vasily Alexandrovich Arkhipov. He was a Russian submarine officer, and he is probably the most important person of the 20th century that you've never heard of. At the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was a Soviet submarine hiding out in the Caribbean, past the quarantine line. The U.S. knew it was there and began dropping depth charges, exploding all around the sub. What the U.S. didn't know was that that submarine was armed with a tactical nuclear torpedo that would explode with the power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. And the captain had been empowered by the Soviets to launch it at will. Uh Uh-oh. Without communication with Moscow for days, the AC is broken and temperatures are climbing above 100 degrees. The sub can't surface without exposing themselves, and there are 11 American ships all within firing range. Hearing the explosions of the depth charges around them, the captain shouts, Maybe the war has already started up there. We're going to blast them now. We will die, but we will sink them all. We will not become the shame of the fleet. It's like a real-life Dr. Strangelove, and it's terrifying. So, a key point, the men on the sub had no idea what was happening above the water. They just knew that they had been told to go straight to Cuba, but then they'd been ordered to sit and wait in the Caribbean. After that, they had had no more communication until explosions began rocking their sub. So, the captain wants to fire, but there was a 34-year-old on board who was the third senior officer on the sub. Launching a nuclear attack required approval from all three men. Two had agreed, but this man said no. He reasoned with the captain that if the Americans had wanted to hit the submarine, they would have. By dropping explosions all around them, they were sending them a signal to surface. This was not an act of war. The young man, Arkhipov, won out, convincing the other officers on board not to fire the torpedo. They surfaced, were seen by a U.S. ship, but not boarded, and they turned around and headed back to Russia. No one would know that this sub had an armed nuclear weapon on board for another 50 years when the documents were declassified by the Russians in 2012. We had no idea just how close the world actually came to all-out nuclear war until just a few years ago. Whoa. So the Cuban Missile Crisis was resolved diplomatically, and after that, the Castro regime was basically left alone. Cuba traded with the Soviets and attempted to spread their communist ideology across the Third World. Che Guevara became a sort of communist ambassador, traveling to countries that were attempting revolution or deep in the middle of civil war to bring Cuban support. He traveled to the Democratic Republic of the Congo with other Cuban fighters to help their ill-fated communist revolution. Che also spent time in Angola during their civil war to help the MPLA, or People's Movement, to support the liberation of Angola in Africa. Surprisingly, Che was also allowed to travel to New York City in 1964, where he made a speech to the United Nations General Assembly. This is a really famous speech, and he spoke out against Western imperialism and urged the UN to help promote peaceful coexistence. Che also railed against the United States, criticizing them for discriminating against their own people of color while claiming to be the champion of freedom abroad. Regardless of your thoughts on Che or communism, it's a pretty badass speech from a social justice perspective. In 1964, Che traveled to Bolivia to try to foment communist rebellion. He was captured by the Bolivian army, aided, of course, by CIA advisors, and he was executed. After his death, just seven years after the Cuban Revolution, Che became a martyr for the communist cause. Today, he is seen as an icon of the far left, although his image and legacy are often misunderstood. For one, Che committed some terrible acts while he served the Cuban government. He oversaw death squads that executed traitors to the revolution after very short and flimsy trials. But also, for someone who hated capitalism with every fiber of his being, it's pretty insane how much crap his face is on. It kills me when I travel to Latin American countries and see Che's face all over shirts, magnets, and mugs. He is rolling over in his grave every time an ignorant college student plasters a Che poster in their college dorm room, right next to Abbey Road and Jimi Hendrix. Does that seem really specific? Yeah, it's because I totally hung all of those up in my dorm room. I was so basic. After Che's death, Cuba chugged along until the fall of the Soviet Union. After its collapse, their economy spiraled downward. The U.S. embargo had always had a huge impact, but when they still had the support of the USSR, they were okay. But the 1990s were rough in Cuba, and Cuba today is still a relatively impoverished country. So I was lucky enough to visit Cuba a few years ago with students, and I just want to share with you three quick things that I learned. One, 
The U.S. embargo is way more intense than I realized. I thought it just meant that Americans can't do business with Cubans, but it's more than that. The U.S. won't do business with anyone in the world who does business with Cuba. So we met a few engineers while we were there who were just trying to get a loan for their company, but no major international bank would do it because then that bank couldn't do business anywhere in the U.S. or with any American companies. Whoa. Two, Cuba is probably the closest any country has gotten to truly trying to implement communist ideology. The government oversees everyone's paycheck, housing, healthcare, and education. And even though everyone is guaranteed all of those things, they aren't all completely equal. Like, the engineers we met get paid more than the bus drivers, and they get nicer government-assigned housing. So everyone has a place to live, but some of those places are really rough. But the Cubans are incredibly proud of what they've accomplished. They have made enormous efforts to protect and regenerate their environment that was destroyed by industrial farming before the revolution. Our tour guide marveled at the fact that her son would go to the same school and have the same educational opportunities as sons of the elites. They offer free college tuition to any student in the country who qualifies through their intense exam system. So truly, anyone can become a doctor or engineer if they are the most intelligent and the hardest working. And they do have a universal healthcare system that works pretty damn well. When Venezuela's Hugo Chavez was diagnosed with cancer, he traveled to Cuba for his treatment. Cuban doctors even visited the U.S. earlier this year in 2018 to help teach doctors on the south side of Chicago about decreasing the infant mortality rate. Hell, one of my students got food poisoning, and we went to a doctor. She checked out my student, gave her medicine to help settle her stomach, and sent us on our way. No annoying paperwork or cash exchange. But, I mean, I did have to communicate entirely in Spanish, forcing me to pull out some pretty deep cuts from my middle school Spanish lessons. I remember thinking in the seventh grade, like, why will I ever need to know the word for lobster in Spanish? Well, young Emily... How about when a student in your care has food poisoning and the doctor asks you to list out everything she ate in the last 24 hours? Sadly, I couldn't remember langosta, so I was forced to act out a lobster in the middle of the doctor's office. I, like, made my hands into little pinchers and made that noise, but, like, she knew what I was trying to say. Three. The last thing I learned, and this is really important, is that the Cubans who live on the island do not want to be like us. When I visited, I kind of arrogantly totally expected them to be desperate for iPhones. I mean, some of them already had them. And Starbucks. But everyone we met was very emphatic that they did not want to be like the U.S. They see us as a place with rampant inequality, gun violence, and corrupt politics. And I gotta say, I had a hard time arguing with them. They were realistic about the issues in Cuba, especially the economy, but they blamed most of that on the U.S. embargo. So I realized something, that by continuing to close off trade to Cuba, we're providing the Cuban government an easy enemy to unite the country against. I also realized that in the United States, we have only one perspective on Cuba for the last 60 years, the voice of Cubans who are no longer on the island. There are tons of exiles living in the U.S., especially in Miami, who have pretty good reason to hate Castro. They were forced out of their homes, some of their family members were executed, or they chose to leave because they disagreed with the direction their country was going in. And their perspective in Miami and across the United States is not wrong, but it's just one side. I was able to meet with dozens of Cubans, and I promise you they had no government supervision, we didn't have minders, these people were not giving us scripted answers. And they showed me another side of the story that is also correct. I realize that the United States has its own value system upon which we judge success. For Americans, success is based on wealth, privilege, and career advancement. But in Cuba, they're just working off of a different value system. To them, on the island, success is based in community, equality, and long-term investment in the environment and the education and health of your citizens. And from their perspective, the U.S. is the country that's failing. Anyway... I'm sure that that rant and this entire episode honestly has gotten me on a government list somewhere and probably lost me a few listeners who don't like to hear that the U.S. isn't always the good guy in history. Sorry, not sorry. But like I said before, it's important to learn as many different perspectives as possible and to understand that our policies have an enormous impact on the entire world. Sometimes it's easy to forget this as we get wrapped up in domestic issues and arguing within Congress. For example, when I traveled to Cuba in the summer before the 2016 election, I can tell you they were following the campaign more closely than most Americans I knew. Their entire lives hinged upon November 2016. 
They knew that if Clinton was elected, she would continue the relaxation of the embargo that was starting to allow them to grow their business and live their lives. And when Trump was elected instead, the Cubans I met were some of the first people that I thought of. And in case you ever travel to Latin America, it's also important to understand that we aren't very popular in a lot of those countries, and as hopefully you've learned, for a fairly good reason. Once when I was in Peru, our rafting guide asked where I was from, and I said, Soy Americana? Ooh, boy, he did not like that. You are Estadounidense. We are all Americans. They're pretty tired of the bully from the North, and I don't blame them. Unfortunately, we're going to continue this trend next episode as we travel to the Middle East for part two of our This Is Why They Hate Us There series. To be continued. For a full transcript of today's episode, visit www.antisocialstudies.org. Join me next time on Antisocial Studies as we explore the Cold War in Asia, or who knew religion was so important to people? And don't forget that if you like what I'm doing, please subscribe to my podcast so you'll know when the next episodes are up. And if you really like what I'm doing, then go to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and give me a review. Thanks. Thanks.